Hello everyone, and welcome again to Nettle, the best platform around for distance learning in business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters for making this video possible, and I would also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well, so please check the link in the description for more details. My name is Sava, and today we are returning to the concept of distribution fitting and goodness of fit, but we are approaching it with a twist today. In our previous videos on the topic, we mainly considered distribution fitting and various theoretical distribution functions for the purpose of modeling stock return distributions. And the major obstacle, the main issue we tried to resolve with varying theoretical distribution functions, such as the error function or the Johnson's SU function, is the various thickness of tails. Stock return distributions have traditionally got heavy or fat tails, meaning that the probability of extreme events on the either side of the distribution, so either extreme upside or extreme downside, is much more likely than the ones implied by the normal distribution. So that's why these error functions, Johnson's SU functions, were developed to accommodate for this stylized fact. However, if we try to model bond returns, the returns of another prominent asset class that you might want to consider for your portfolio, and uh, you might want to understand the risk profile and the nature of the empirical distribution of these returns to model your risk exposures more precisely, the major issue there is not that the tails are particularly thick, well, sure, they can be a little bit thicker than the normal distribution, but the major problem is that the downside of bond investment and investment in any credit instrument in general is quite a bit higher than its upside. Because, well, there are few ways how the bond investment or credit investment can go better than expected, and uh, a lot of ways how it can go worse than expected. The obliger can default, there can be an extension, there can be some credit event, while if the repayment goes according to plan, it's pretty much just the default payoff that you're obtaining, isn't it? So the idea is that the payoff structure of such portfolios would be asymmetric, and in turn, the return distribution of bonds should be asymmetric meaning that the left tail of the distribution should be much more prominent than the right tail. And today we're trying to investigate that by considering the return distribution of the high-yield bond ETF over a five-year period. And if we see the descriptive statistics, the moments of the distribution, we can see that the average return of this ETF is quite a bit lower than one you would encounter in stock returns, in stock benchmarks, while the risk daily standard deviation is also quite a bit higher. When we look at Curtis's, we can see that it's uh, not as high as you would see for stock returns. However, it's still around three, uh, quite a bit higher than zero implied by the normal distribution. Skewness here, the measure of distribution asymmetry, is positive. However, if you look at the lowest return and the highest return in our five years worth of data, is that the highest return is 1.68%, uh, in a day, and the lowest return is minus 2%, reflecting this stylized fact that the downside of bond investment is potentially quite a bit lower than the upside. And to account for that theoretically, a theoretical distribution that could generate such shapes with a heavier left tail than right tail is the asymmetric Laplace distribution, that is a generalization of the original Laplace distribution that we all know and love, and that we have already investigated in one of the previous videos. So check this out, if the original Laplace distribution is what you're here for. The asymmetric Laplace augments the standard Laplace distribution function that is defined in terms of uh, location parameter mu and scale parameter b, and we are having them over here, with an asymmetry parameter k. And uh, the Parameter k can take any positive values from 0 to infinity, pretty much. And uh, we can easily see that if the value of k is 1, then this generalized asymmetric Laplace distribution function just reduces to standard Laplace. As this expression over here goes to a half, this expression goes uh, to a half, 
and these values of k in the denominator and the numerator respectively don't play any role if k is equal to 1 again. However, if we vary k, then we can arrive at varying structures, varying asymmetries in our distribution with a heavier left tail or a heavier right tail. And in particular, if k is higher than 1, we are dealing with left tails being more prominent. As we can see here that the left tail in that case would be much more massive than the right tail. This k squared doing most of the job and this k in the denominator also uh, providing its role in terms of the scaling of the tail being slower. And uh, the other way around it goes for values of k below 1 that generate a right tail that is heavier and uh, more uh, observations would be concentrated on the right hand side of your chart. In terms of the probability density function, the logic is very similar again. Here uh, we go into the, our exponent function here and have k in the denominator for the left hand side and the numerator for the right hand side. And again, varying our k, we can arrive at varying probability density functions that reflect the asymmetric nature of our real world bond return distribution. And uh, here we can see the theoretical values of skewness and curtises generated by such a distribution. And you can clearly see that if k goes above 1, so left tail more prominent than right tail, our skewness predictably will go below 0. Negative skewness implies that your left tail is heavier. And for the curtises, we can see that if k is equal to 1, then the value of curtises will reduce to 3, the standard value for the original Laplace distribution. And if k is not uh, 1, if it's either lower or higher, then curtises would be above 3. And uh, that matches quite nicely what we have got here in terms of our statistical moments of the real-world distribution. And uh, logically, asymmetrical plus can be quite fitting for bond returns and bond benchmarks, given the fact that it can accommodate for uh, varying levels of skewness, and it also can accommodate for moderately uh, fat tails, here accommodating a courtesy of 3.56. So without further ado, let's code the cumulative distribution function and the probability density function for a symmetrical plus and try and use maximum likelihood to calibrate these three parameters to arrive at a reasonably good fit. So here for the cumulative distribution function, we need to consider two cases. If our rank return in cell E3 is less than or equal, to our location parameter mu over here, then we need to return our asymmetry parameter k squared, and uh, needless to say, we lock the rows for our, all our distribution parameters and don't lock anything for our rank return, as we want it to change throughout our sample and we don't want the parameters to change throughout our sample. So we get k squared divided by 1 plus k squared, and then we multiply it by the exponent function of scaled x. And here k, the symmetry parameter, goes into the denominator. So we get e3, the rank return, minus mu in the numerator, and in the denominator we have got our scale parameter b multiplied by the symmetry parameter k. And we can close the parentheses and proceed to the next case, investigating the cases where x is above our location parameter mu. In that case, we need to return 1 minus 1 over 1 plus k squared and multiplying it by the exponent function. And uh, this is very similar to the one we coded just previously, so we can copy it across and tweak it slightly. First of all, here we need to return a minus sign to account for the fact that uh, our right tail has uh, positive values of x minus mu, and here, instead of dividing by k in the denominator, we have to just multiply by it in the numerator. So we can get rid of these parentheses over here, and the logic will be preserved. And now we can close the parentheses and enforce the cumulative distribution function. For the probability density function, we need to do a similar trick. We need to consider two cases. If our rank return in cell E3 is less than or equal to our location parameter mu. And by the way, as the function is smooth, you can either put less than or equal or less, it wouldn't affect the results. If we are on the left tail, 
then we need to return this value of the probability density function with k in the denominator again. So the exponent of e3 minus the location over b times k in the denominator. And then we need to divide it by the scale parameter b, as in the standard Laplace distribution, times uh, this uh, adjustment parameter k plus 1 over k. So k plus 1 over k in the denominator. And that's what we need to do for the left-hand side of the distribution. For the right-hand side of the distribution, we can again copy this exponent function and tweak it slightly. To weaken it slightly, we can input a minus sign in front of x minus mu over here. And again, here in the exponent function, we need to get rid of these parentheses to make sure we're multiplying by our symmetry parameter instead of dividing by it. And that's pretty much it for the probability density function of asymmetrical plus. Uh, the only thing we need to account for is that we are optimizing log likelihood, so we need to return the natural log of the whole expression. And bottom like clicking it all the way down for all of our observations, we can calculate our log likelihood by summing the values of the natural logs of all probability density function values. And we can calculate the supremum, so the maximum deviation of our empirical distribution function from our asymmetrical pass distribution function. And we can see that this deviation is quite high, but it's unsurprising as we haven't optimized our parameters yet. To optimize, to calibrate our distribution parameters, we can go data solver and set our log likelihood function, our objective function being that, to the maximum by changing our variable cells that represent distribution parameters, mu, b, and k. Now, as we need to allow uh, mu to be negative if it's required, we can untick this, this box, make unconstrained variables not negative, and add the restrictions on b and k, as we want them to be positive. And we need to make it greater than or equal to a very small uh, positive number, so 0 0.0001, for example. And then we can add a similar restriction on our symmetry parameter k, make it greater than or equal to 0 0.0001. And then we can stick with our gradient descent algorithm, judge nonlinear, and click solve, and wait until the algorithm converges to the optimal value of log likelihood. We can see that our log likelihood value has increased quite a bit, and our supremum has decreased quite a bit to 2.38%, which is generally a very good value for this absolute deviation of the theoretical distribution function from the empirical distribution function. To see graphically how well it fits, we can compare the fit of the normal distribution in orange here, uh, and uh, the asymmetric Laplace cumulative distribution function in gray here to our real-world empirical distribution function in blue. And we can see that the fit, even looking at the graph, is much, much better. The deviations only occurring here on the right tail. If we look at the parameter values we have just estimated, we can see that our asymmetry parameter is uh, greater than 1, meaning that the theoretical skewness of our uh, bond returns is actually negative, meaning that the left tail is a little bit thicker than the right tail. And that's what you expect to see for bond return distributions. We can even calculate the theoretical values of the skewness and kettesis of our distribution using these formulas and the parameter k we have just optimized. So the theoretical skewness would be 2 times 1 minus the asymmetry parameter k to the sixth power over 1 plus the same parameter k to the power of 4, and all this bracket goes to the power of 3 halves. So we can see that such a value of the asymmetry parameter k would give us a skewness of minus 0 0.12 approximately, which is something very uh, representative of uh, bond return benchmarks. And the kurtices will be represented by a formula 6 times 1 plus k to the power of 8, over 1 plus k to the fourth, all squared. And the kurtices is slightly higher than 3, and that's what's happening if the asymmetry parameter is slightly different from 1. 
uh, the value of 1 would give us 3 exactly. Uh, any other value would give us a higher and higher deviation from 3, reflecting fatter and fatter tails, particularly with regard to left tail if k is higher than 1, and the right tail if k is lower than 1. And that's how you can use the asymmetric Laplace distribution to proxy asymmetric risk of your return distribution of your asset class, bond returns in particular. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions on videos for business, economics, or finance topics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.